Welcome all to another dialogue, this time with Lou, who is a member of the Halkion Guild. And I've known Lou now for more than a year through some of my courses and other projects. Lou is working on a project of his own, which is quite an important one, I would think. And he will say a bit more about this in a minute, but I think I can say it's on the ontology of the information age. So Lou, welcome. Thanks very much, Johannes. Yeah, I, I've uh, been doing your seminars. The, the first uh, course that you did with uh, with Justin Murphy back uh, back in the day now on Deleuze and Heidegger technology kind of restarted my, my gears, my cybernetic gears thinking about this issue. Because um, I, I, uh, I started studying Heidegger back in 2009 and was just totally engrossed by it. Um, I studied you know, him for probably three or four years, um, very intensely, uh, at least for me. And um, start to think like, okay, um, sort of, I, I see the, the scope, the sweep of Heidegger's thought. And now I want to kind of, you know, in a very crude way, apply it to my own time. What, what's the, what can I do to carry this project forward in some way? And so I thought, okay, he has this uh, history of being, you know, sometimes. So perhaps we could say that our epoch, you know, he has some references to this himself. He talks about an age of machination, the age of Gestell. Of, of positionality. Um, and I thought, you know, we, the, the big development kind of culturally since Heidegger's time has been the computer. Um, so what can we say about what the computer does for the history, the history of being? Um, and he actually has some references to this himself uh, in the Heraclitus seminar with uh, Eugen Fink, he talks about cybernetics um, and, and in, in a few other plays, I think he even references cybernetics. So quite prescient considering how, considering how new the discipline of cybernetics was. Um, and so as you look at the computer, as you look at uh, what is the essence of a computer, I, I was led to the concept of information. And I remember, you know, in school, uh, you would be given these charts of our own, <laughs> the own our own uh, school curriculum history of being of like you had the age of discovery, Marco Polo, Columbus. You had the the age of imperialism with the great empires in the 19th century, and then you had in the 1960s the the space age, and now we live in the information age. And so just think about what does that mean, and. Uh, I mean, first of all, just in the most basic way possible, what is information, this concept that we use everywhere and here all the time, and then um, bring that into relation with Heidegger's thought. Very good. So yeah, Heidegger speaks uh, several places. It is quite off cybernetics. I think he himself still regards or tries to make sense of the nuclear age, which was the label at the time, what that even is supposed to mean and what it says to us. He says somewhere that the atomic bomb exploded 500 years ago. Yes. With Descartes. And we are simply um, working out this long extended explosion. And what is then, I mean, I, I'll, I'll say a few words on maybe on information as a it, so it's <clears throat> its etymology. It's obviously Latin. Yes. As the word uh, forma, in there, which means form, but also gestalt mm -hmm. or shape. Um, the verb to inform is mentioned in English for the first time in the 14th century or the 1400s. means to train or instruct in some specific subject. It comes then from French, informé. Um, to instruct and to teach, but of course its root is informare, which means to bring into form, to bring into shape. Mm -hmm. It's not listed <clears throat> by the Brothers Grimm mm -hmm. in their etymological dictionary of the German language, which is from the 1800s. So they don't list it yet. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's now listed in the Duden, obviously, being that it's uh, everywhere. But uh, I've got one... 
uh, reference from, I think you'd say in English, Hyginus, Hyginus. Mm -hmm. he Heidegger quotes uh, Hyginus actually to talk about care, cura. Yes, yes the, the story of care. And here in um, the chapter on Andromeda and uh, Cassiope, who claimed that her daughter, Andromeda, is more beautiful than the gods, um, <clears throat> was then uh, met uh, by, she was then had to be uh, <laughs> uh, sacrificed to the gods, of course, they wanted their due for this outrageous claim of a mere mortal. But Perseus, Perseus, Perseus brought the head of one of the Gorgones, Medusa would be the most known one, right? That uh, with the, the snake head that would turn human beings into stone. And so here, Hyginus speaks of in, in Latin, so when they're shown the face, ab humana specie sunt informati in Saxon. So ab humana specie, away from the human specimen or away from the human appearance, sunt informati, they are informed or formed into Saxon, into stone. So here I found uh, a mentioning of the word uh, informati. Wow. And an early one. So it has to do with uh, with Gestaltung, or with, with turning something into a, a different Gestalt, interestingly, into stone. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we can use this as an interesting uh, information. But what do you think? I mean, this is preliminary, perhaps. Uh, but what, what is information? Or is that even the right question? Yes, I mean, that that is the obvious question to begin with. And right away, if you search for um, you know, books on this, um, you'll find different scholars are kind of making a career now about, you know, information ethics or things like that. But the first thing that anybody says is it's very hard to define information. It has many different names. You can go the kind of more rigorous way of looking at from people like Claude Shannon and, you know, actual engineers of computer in the early cybernetic kind of world. They have, they try and give a very precise mathematically usable um, and for my own purposes, I try and keep the, I'm trying to look for a way of defining that, um, I guess, uh, early, early Heidegger had a, a kind of a technique or a way of proceeding, uh, that is English is translated as formal indication. And that means this is not a definition that we're going to stick to axiomatically and never give up, but it's sort of a pointing at the phenomena that allows us to just begin thinking um, in a way that is revisable later on, but in a way that in some way designates the phenomena in a, in a strict enough way that we can think about it concretely. And I, I, that, that was a great etymological uh, review of information because it is interesting, just the word and how we use it is a combination of forma, shape, um, which obviously links to kind of form and matter in some way of like uh, of metaphysics, yes. we would say. Yes. But also when we are informed or when I, somebody says, I have some information for you, there is the sense of something is new, something is original, something, there's some novelty. And certainly novelty in people like Bergson, Deleuze, um, even to some degree Schelling talking about a, a positive kind of philosophy, which kind of breaks through the, the strict system of, of just negative uh, philosophy. There is this moment of a kind of non-systematic newness that breaks through kind of the, 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 the systems network in a way. Um, so anyway, these are all loose associations, but just to, to get your mind thinking about it, there, there's this, this, this strange thing. Um, so, um, in thinking about, you know, the computer and information, I have uh, come to see that computation is really just calculation. You know, we have this new word, it sounds very modern, very kind of we're living in a new age, the computer yeah. age. But there, there, I have seen no good argument that says computation is any different than calculation. And calculation is a very, very ancient you know, going back to Babylonians and even before, very ancient practice. Computation is just, you know, uh, a practice different in degree, but not in kind from calculation. It's just a 
very, very advanced abacus. Um, and so with that in mind, that computation is calculation. Um, I've been trying to think that what is the relationship between calculation, reckoning that Heidegger talks about, and machination, where um, definitely machines and calculation, they seem related, but what is actually the, the kind of logical or even just philosophical link between a calculative and a, and a machination uh, concept of things? And my sort of starting guess right now is the concept of function. And this is a concept that really Leibniz, uh, reading Aristotle, comes up with. But again, you can go more mathematical. A mathematical function is something every you know schoolboy and girl learns about. But a mathematical function, uh, basically, it's a strict relationship between inputs and outputs, and that to me is what what information is. Information is viewing phenomena, viewing beings as functionalizable, as, as able to be functionalized, put into a system of inputs and outputs such that they can be calculated and therefore controlled like a machine. Um, that's my sort of uh, uh, starting point for, for thinking about yep. information. On Leibniz, perhaps. Leibniz is a strange figure because on the one hand, he's probably invented to some degree what we now call calculus or algebra, modern algebra before Newton. Um, he wanted or did write or attempted to write a, a matesis universalis, uh, an alphabet of thoughts that uh, wouldn't allow to solve all problems. Um, because every thought or goes is directly captured by one sign. Um, but still, he was not a mechanist, as, for example, Descartes was. There seems to be some sort of telos. There is also a totality, because this world is the best of all possible worlds that, in, that introduces a notion of totality. Whereas we know, for example, from Hegel, that quantity in itself is necessarily boundless mm -hmm. um by when we but so when we just stay on on form or formation um i think what occurs with um after leibniz and with people like frege etc and of all, all already with kant is the attempt to um to to construct objects without contradiction and to also with Frege then explicitly more so than even perhaps with with uh, Leibniz is that um, thought is supposed to be freed or liberated from language mm -hmm. and formalized then without content so mm -hmm. to this is in very broad strokes obviously but just to give an idea logic is still an organon for Aristotle it's, as it were, a tool. Um, but there cannot be form, morphe, without hule, without matter. Hegel, the good Aristotle that he is, of course, says that form is matter and matter is form. But here, and, and logos is articulated in this, this, the, the speech of Aristotle. But um, to be liberated from language, perhaps, is at the core of of the information revolution is that it doesn't require natural language it requires a calculative language or an artificial language to construct contradiction free disambiguated signifiers yes yes that that that, that sounds right on point um and you know, part of the ambition or, you know, some might say the, the substantial arrogance of my project is that I really am intending to, perhaps in a long, over a long period of time, master these very, you know, difficult, very specialized mathematical traditions of logic that are, you know, 
seen as that's what logic is now kind of the 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 there's one history of logic that's like it's all it's all progress towards mathematical logic and the other traditions that have kind of fallen by the wayside and it really seems to me that you've got to be able to speak very um uh very competently about all these different traditions i just have one book here um this is a this is a, a correspondent of Russell, uh, Philip E. B. Jourdain, and uh, he I had to get this book by the way from <laughs> this Italian press um, that was it was very hard to acquire. But the Italians are doing good work on uh, the history of logic. Um, at least we're printing old books. But I, there's just one diagram here that I find so. Um, instructive. So you won't be able to read all the details here. But what he's showing here is a diagram of basically um, logic in the 19th century. And there's two basically traditions, at least in the more mathematical part, there's the algebraic tradition, and the mathematical tradition. And I won't go into detail about those differences. But just all that to say there was substantial discussion about what the nature of logic is should be. And I feel like a lot of that discussion and that kind of the philosophical content of just having questions about logic um, has been kind of uh, put by the wayside. Um, you know, lot Heidegger's uh, probably one of his more substantial courses on logic is logic, the question of truth. And so he's, he wants to connect logic to truth. And there are many people say like, no, it's just a, a formal system and the kind of whether it's true or not is irrelevant to the to the practice itself, and so yes. there are many philo rich philosophical questions here. It, it, but this is the so Leibniz still articulates an ontology, yes. even in his attempts to formalize. Whereas with Frege explicitly, and maybe even before with Hobbes, um, who also thought that thinking is mere calculation um with frege logic is divided from ontology yes but you would say that there is indeed an ontology that comes with it because this is something that is quite strange when you when you consider some analytical philosophers there was a uh a <laughs> I, a talk I attended many years ago at some college I may or may not have attended in London, um, where a lady who, a professor who teaches and researches ancient philosophy, gave a talk on Aristotelian logic. Mm -hmm. And some of the gentlemen, quite aggressively, uh, more of the uh, uh, Wittgensteinian, Frigian um, school, said, well, no. <laughs> uh, essence is anything I say. E essence is not ontological. It, it need not be grounded. If, if I can say pink elephant, that means there is a possible world where there is a pink elephant. So what I find striking is that on the one hand, in, in just in the way that we understand information, when you know, information is true, right? And we have we have this notion of misinformation or disinformation, which can be. Mm -hmm. Uh, dispensed across the globe and there can be fake news etc mm -hmm. uh, i sometimes jokingly say all news are fake because they're <laughs> all filtered through a certain framework um but the, the the strange thing then perhaps is that we think of information as necessarily true wikipedia is the place of for disambiguation and dispensing of agreed upon information at the same time information seems to be because it's divided from content and from ontology it seems to be open to manipulation because it doesn't really matter what we are talking about as long as formally dogmatically in formalistic terms it's not true but it corresponds to its signifiers within itself within so you, you can construct a perfectly formalistic uh, system that's in itself holds up that doesn't need to correspond to anything except it is purely self-referential, as it were. So yes. the, the, the disconnect seems to be that we, we think of information as, is it true, is it true information? Yeah, it must be true, it's information. 
uh, but also um, that if information indeed has to do with formal logic or with the formalizing of the word, then that seems to be a disconnect. Do, am I making it clear enough what I'm trying to say? Yes, absolutely. And the way I would describe it is that bomb that went off uh, 500 years ago has, you know, it smashed all of our senses of, of <laughs> truth and, and meaning to bits. And it is smashing them to bits with this cybernetic machine. Yeah. And what that allows you to do is that we have more information than ever. I'll talk about information overload, all these things. And the, and the, the more you, let's say, informationalize the world, the easier it is to sculpt that meaningless information that that you know, in, into whatever you want and so we're seeing all of these beautiful information sculptures take very many forms now yes. um and uh yeah and you and you said um you, you referenced hobbes and yes. i would uh, i this is only something i've recently started thinking about but i think there's something here and wittgenstein yeah. I, I'm coming to the conclusion more and more that what cybernetics is, is the praxis of the legacy of positivism. So positivism is a kind of ontology-less ontology. And that I, is yeah, what yeah, is yeah, kind yeah. of being imposed on, on the world through cybernetics, um, is, is um, you know, one way of, of talking very generally about positivism, because of course there's many strains we're speaking with in very broad strokes here, um, but keeping our eye on the phenomena. Um, positivism is never gonna tell you why or even what something is, but it can just tell you how it operates. And that's sort of, it's just a, a, a totalized system of just how everything is, is moving, but without any why or what even to it. And, um, if you have a conception of logic that enables you to, to do that rigorously, um, in, the, in the end, it's going to just be maximized for functionalizability, put into whatever function you want. Um, and uh, there, there's a great essay, for example, by um, a historian of logic. His, one of his famous anthologies is from Frege to Gero. But he was also secretary to, to Leon Trotsky, interesting uh, coincidence there. And uh, he has a paper called Logic as Language versus Logic as Calculus. And uh, just kind of on this issue of what is logic exactly? Is it trying to create a perfect language where you'll have the true signs of things? That's kind of how, for example, William of Ockham, this, who wrote uh, the Summa Logica in the Middle Ages, that's how he's like, You'll just get the true names of things, um, and and that and it'll be sort of a, a perfect language. Um, the the in the in for example the this time the Renaissance time and the early modern you have um, people like Raymond Lull, um, Leibniz is definitely in this tradition, um, uh, uh, and uh, you know they're coming out of weird traditions like alchemy and, and things like that, but this idea of a perfect language where you'll basically have the God's names for all things. And if you just speak that language, you'll never be mistaken. You can never fall into error. So, so that might be one idea of logic is just creating the proper categories for all thought and speaking. Then you have logic as calculus where logic is somehow a way for just calculating the validity of any argument or calculating the truth or calculating the correct functionalization of any speech. Um, and it's, it's interesting to think how we would, how would we even go about adjudicating that? But um, I, I would say that when you think of things as information or when you're interpreting the world as information, you're already kind of answering the question of what logic is already. And how far? How far? Yeah. How, how do you mean? How are you so, answering them? Yeah. Yeah. So, so kind of what you were saying that information is a, uh, is, is a way of designating things that, uh, makes them maximal, maximal, maximally functionalizable, maximally manipulable, um, uh, de-worlded, let's say, from their, their context. Yeah. They become mere data to be put through an algorithm or to be put through a calculus. 
Um, and so you're already kind of answering like logic is a calculus then. What logos, what logike is, is a calculus for functionalizing information. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so the kind of even to even ask what logic is when we have these incredible uh, these incredible achievements of modern logic and modern computation, which is its heir, um, to even ask, you no, know, maybe logic isn't just calculation. That's, you know, that's uh, look, look at if we just conceive of logic as calculation, look at all that we can do. We can, we can see everything as information. <laughs> But that's striking though, right? That it's, begins with an attempt to deontologize or be entirely free from ontology but now becomes uh or seems to be becoming some sort of a bastard ontology in its own right and and lets the world appear as information which should indicate when i say this that things appear we appear as heaps of information, for example, of data. Um, by the way, Heidegger call, says about positivism in the Beiträge, uh, that it's the crudest form of metaphysics because they've decided what beings are unquestioningly, which is uh, data, and yeah. and uh, then uh, apply um, the, the most simplistic form of causation to that uh, beingness of beings. Um, so, but it, it, it's, I mean, it, this leads then, this could lead also to questions and how far, you know, would it even be possible to have any kind of an ontology of something that is seemingly so manipulable mm-hmm. um, or what kind of an ontology would this be? I always, you know, there, there, there was this fad, um, which is now as trends uh, want to do or fashions I want to do is now fading. Um, of the new realism or speculative realism. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that dogma is summarized in the statement that everything that exists is what it means to exist, Mm -hmm. which is, which is a, I think an embarrassment because it actually, if, if you introduce that kind of a radical contingency, then there is no, no need for an ontology. Um, It, it, but it, at least there's an instinct of reason there because it tries to move back to things as they are in themselves, which, as we know, can't made more or less impossible. Um, and it would also be interesting to maybe bring in Kant to a certain degree at some point. Um, but how is it that, I mean, how, how would, would, I mean, you, this is at the very beginning of it, but what would this ontology What would it try to do? Would it try to carve out um, what information does to the world and point to something beyond information? Or does it, as it were, affirm uh, information uh, mm-hmm. as the ontology and try and make sense of it in that sense as just the next epoch of the history of being? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, just just I guess in a kind of almost descriptive and historical sense, try to understand what would it mean to live in a world where being appears as information, and, and what does that uh, what does that cash out as, so to speak? And yeah. it is, I mean, the the people who uh, I don't want in any way seem that like um, I I doubt the. Uh, the intellectual firepower of cybernetics and positivism, like these are the brightest minds of many of their, their quarters. Um, but I think that you can still ask philosophical questions uh, yeah. very questioningly of them. So for example, the, the person who coined the term cybernetics, which is you know strange why he, he picked that word. It had already been used by uh, a French uh, thinker named Ampère who, use it in a kind of more political context. So it's interesting that uh, this man, Norbert Wiener, took the, uh, took the term to, to describe his own discipline. He was a student, by the way, of Bertrand Russell. Um, and j- this is just from a paper. This is fascinating. Um, Wiener used the term cybernetics to characterize the common elements of his work <laughs> with Vannevar Bush on computing machines, with Yuke Wing Lee on electrical networks, 
with Julian Bigelow on the prediction of uh, airplane flight paths, with Arthur Rosenbluth on neuromuscular behavior and neurophysiology in organisms, and with radar stations and uh, with uh, other, uh, other tools of war. So it's amazing that he was, I'm gonna create a discipline that combines all of these seemingly totally disparate fields into yeah. one. So there is a, 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 an incredible power and versatility to the concept of information that it can capture the processes uh, that are at work in so many of the sort of scientific interpretations of our, of our world around us. Um, and to me, that's just, that is incredible that this concept of information, which is a fairly modern one, is sort of the, the widest, uh, the widest name we have for everything in a way. It's, it's not say spirit or matter or yes. form. It's not, you know, it's information. Well, okay. You mentioned spirit, spirit, geist, geist is becomes a, a, a term of art or a technical philosophical term in the third critique mm -hmm. in Kant's third critique where spirit in this is, is only mentioned almost en passant but then of course is explicated by Hegel and Schelling spirit is what in simplified terms mediates between nature and the human being mm -hmm. So any philosophy of spirit is one of mediation one way or another. If, if you're Schelling, then it's a, a mediated, sorry, an unmediated mediacy. It's just a givenness, mm -hmm. almost mystical, uh, which according to Hegel precludes freedom. We always mm -hmm. want, we want a mediated immediacy. We want to be with what is there, but mediated. Mm -hmm. But information seems to be, um, it seems to be more in the Schellingian, right? Uh, it's a it's an unmediated mediacy, a givenness. Cybernetics also has a I think an important etymological origin. It's from Greek kubernan or kubernain, um, mm -hmm. which means to steer a ship or to be the pilot of a ship and to guide and govern also. Um, and Heidegger says about cybernetics in anyone who's interested in a shorter text, uh, the end of philosophy or das Ende der Philosophie. Heidegger says, uh, die Kybernetik bildet die Sprache um zu einem Austausch von Nachrichten. Cybernetics reforms or yeah, reshapes language so that it becomes a tool for the exchange of news. Die Künste werden zu gesteuerten, gesteuert steuernden Instrumenten der Information. The arts become steered, steering instruments of information. Yes, that, that, that sense of formation as a former, as a, as a able to, to steer and guide um, Yeah. The human being, the world, we, yeah. we might leave it blank what, what it's steering for right now. <laughs> um, and well, yeah, well, it's, yeah, go ahead. No, if you follow Heidegger, then it's not the human being yes. doing anything, really. But uh, it's the, the, the presence of being itself that's enacting this, that's at work through the responses of the human being, of course, um, but it's the exclusive or predominant dimension now of being, is that everything appear or can appear as, not only, right? Because it not, not everything just appears only as information, but it can right. appear as information and can be steered and guided and governed as such, which then precludes other ways of being, of course, also, but It's not the only one. It's never the, there's never just one dimension of being, right. but it appears to be exclusive. Yes, it shows itself as exclusive. Um, and I'm glad you brought up Hegel because Heidegger says elsewhere, that it's kind of a mysterious phrase, but 
uh, a, a mysterious statement rather that Hegel prepared the way for positivism. And it seems like, well, that's crazy. Hegel, the, there's nobody the positivists hate more than Hegelian style, geistlich, geschichtlich, you know, metaphysics. But remember Hegel's science of logic. Logic and metaphysics become the same there for him. And that is very, and it's almost like an ontologious ontology already, much more, I would say, expanded and much more metaphysically uh, informed. Yeah. But there is a, an almost a strange uh, moment of commonality with the, the, the spirits, uh, spirit circling around itself and the kind of cybernetic feedback loops Mm -hmm. um and so in this i don't i don't know i'm just just say that hegel is a cybernetic system I, I think it's much it's more complex than that but there is this strange kinship of hegel's project and um cybernetic systems as as much as they would want to or at least the analytics would hate to be in any way associated with hegel there's a great phrase i, I forget who it's from but um, some analytic philosopher saying like, I would readily learn logic from Hegel as I would, uh, you know, uh, cuisine from uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, the cannibal serial killer, you know. <laughs> so, but so, uh, so on um, Hegel and, and Heidegger, of course, so Heidegger has um, a collection of notes on negativity in Hegel. Mm -hmm. where if you ask a Hegel scholar like Stephen Holgate, he's not too taken by it because Heidegger seems to understand negativity as a horizon, mm -hmm. as something that the logic is it, it posits and then pushes towards. Mm -hmm. if a more Hegelian reading of Hegel is that negativity becomes necessary imminently because if it doesn't show up right at the beginning with being pure being, the text would simply stop. Mm -hmm. So loss and collapse, uh, being vanishing into nothing, nothing vanishing into being, etc., becoming, becoming, uh, or turning into becoming this vanishing uh, is a continuous um, progress of loss. Uh, and then a, a remembering of that loss in the previous category in the next category. Mm -hmm. Still, what Heidegger says in this collection of notes on negativity is that Death, the negativity, it never gets serious with death. There is no catastrophe, which means no catastrophe. He uses the Greek word, which means something like a, an overturning is never possible. Mm -hmm. And it is quite striking that if we take, which we shouldn't just, you know, pull out sentences, but in one of the uh, introductions to the phenomenology of the uh, prefaces, Hegel says that um, death is a non-actuality horrifying etc but life and i'm paraphrasing life must stride through this non-actuality through death through utter negativity we could say also so that life becomes fully itself so the positive life itself requires to become free and become fully itself the negative early cybernetics if i'm not mistaken was aware of the need for the negative a negative feedback loop in order to enhance a positive feedback loop i know that in accelerationist circles it's all about the positive feedback loop now um, but what's striking about this steering system right the cybernetic steering system is that it can very easily use critique uh or any kind of an antithesis negativity etc to reorganize and then steer with even more power. Yes. Um, so. Yes, if you, if you sort of jump up one level, it seems like, okay, you have something, but, but it's being critiqued, so it shows that there's resistance. But if yes, you yes. sort of jump up one level and think, okay, what is, on a higher order, what is invariant here? It's sort of information being incorporated into a <laughs> feedback loop. And so the, the process itself is reinforced by resistance to it. Um, and there's something very kind of Hegelian about that. Um, uh, and yeah, to, to, to bring it uh, to uh, your point about Heidegger uh, on Hegel. Um, yeah, I, I listened to, to Holgate's lectures uh, as well. And, you know, 
seems to Hegelians are kind of unimpressed with Schelling's later critiques. Or Heidegger says that Schelling's uh, Freiheitsschrift, his uh, his, his uh, writing on the on freedom, shattered Hegel's logic before it was even published. Um, and so there is there is this idea that perhaps we can prepare the ground for some kind of thinking that not just forcefully exits these feedback loops, these cybernetic feedback loops, but just a kind of thinking that um, is sensitive to being showing up as something other than information. Um, I have uh, page 138 yeah. from Heidegger's yeah. What is Metaphysics, when he says that logos is fusis. And that's just one, that, that's kind of one, I would guess, um, uh, guiding uh, idea of, of my project is how does Heidegger's thought prepare a way mm -hmm. of, um, you know, maybe like Deleuze becoming imperceptible, but Heidegger, I would say, is even, is even more uh, pow uh, powerful, is not the right word, but even more ambitious of, of really preparing the ground for some sort of future appearance. Uh, of a new of a new way that things can show up for us. I I think that this is um, <clears throat> especially towards the end of his his life. I, I, precisely what he's trying to think after he says about Hegelian dialectics or Hegel's dialectics that and this is in the Freiburg talks that the, this dialectics is now the steering mechanism of the world. Not Marxist dialectics, not material materialistic dialectics, but Hegelian dialectics, yes. which would include. But he also, at, at the end of his life, he also is is um, a lot more sympathetic to Hegel. Yes, uh, he begins to hear in the word Aufheben, which in English is sublate or cancel out, etc. He begins to hear in Aufheben also a notion of concealing, bergen, sheltering, um, and so I think to be fair to Hegel. It's true that the science of logic and the encyclopedia, it's interesting, you mentioned this once to me last year, right? Is, isn't it fascinating that it's called encyclopedia, that here's a, yes. a, a cycle you can say, but no, that's too what you meant there. Uh, there's a cycle closing itself off. Um, but um, with it's, it's true that Hegel's logic and the phenomenology, uh, because it's, it's rendering explicit and transparent the workings of thought, Mm -hmm. And and he and Hegel, you know, consciously completes philosophy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, he knows what he's doing. He's completely aware of his uh, exposure of what is being thought mm -hmm. without presupposition. But mm -hmm. you know, when you read the logic and you have the tradition in the background, um, you, you can see that oh, now it's Parmenides, now it's Heraclitus, even if they're not mentioned. It's moving through the history of philosophy so-called uh and and explicating it and making it rendering it explicit so it's true that the logic can be attacked as it were from the operations of the neurosciences or or cybernetics um but we would i think probably re it would be reductive to see it only as that because it it's yes. not trying to understand thinking as mechanic or of the of or machinel um, of the machine um, because the machine doesn't know self reflection right so someone who's not who's who doesn't who's not amazed at the at thinking itself but only looks at brain uh, waves. Uh, that connect when we see uh, a naked woman uh, or, or or an alligator on on a picture. That's purely looking at at, at the the functionality, but not at uh, but doesn't rise to the level of spirit. But this is also the this entire talk about artificial intelligence. If we actually read what is intelligence, intelligence, intelligence is in simplified terms is the remem the remembering or memorizing of images. Yes. And the rearranging of images, as Hegel puts it. So artificial intelligence will be very good at memorizing images and rearranging them according to signifiers, information, etc. But it will not rise to genuine mediation, which then has to do with human freedom, 
um, etc. So, but you can. That, yes, that was that was, a, that was a great that was a great riff, and I yeah I, I want to make clear that it, of course like you know uh, Heidegger is was my uh, is is definitely the the biggest influence, but I just from sort of uh, Heidegger's various statements throughout his career that kind of show an anxiety about how difficult Hegel is, just make me very intrigued as like, wow, this is somebody who can kind of stand up to Heidegger and through like reading Hegel myself now for a couple of years, it's like, wow, there, you know, he, there is no easy summarization of him and there's no easy dismissal of him in any way. Um, and uh, what you said about neuroscience, you know, uh, my, my Hegel professor, um, uh, he, tran he translated the, the logic couple of years ago, but he would say that you can just replace the chapter in the phenomenology of spirit about phrenology, about reason is, a, is the shape of a skull with neuroscience and MRI images. You know, it's, it's the same. He's a, his arguments work just as well. It's like you cannot, you can never reduce reason to some, some, some material appearance. Um, and uh, he also says in the preface to the phenomenology, which I thought, which struck me like a bolt of lightning when I read it, he talks exactly about the mathematical way of doing philosophy and the way that philosophy could be calculation. He says, this is clearly inadequate. I think he's actually attacking Schelling, who is kind of Spinozistic. And we know Spinoza ends his arguments with QED, <laughs> quad era demonstrando, you know, the, the geometric uh, 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 proof. Um, and Hegel, you know, the first thing to say is that the, the method or the form of the argument bears no relation to the content. And that's that was my first inkling of what his dialectics is, is like, you can't just have a an arbitrary accidental form of, of reasoning that has no, that bears no relationship to the content of the reasoning. And so this mingling of form and content um, of, a, yeah. of a what and how, you know, that, that that's a first indication of, of what of what his dialectic might be. It's also maybe uh, worth just briefly pointing out uh, always the trouble of translation, where Kahn speaks in of a critique der reinen Vernunft, mm -hmm. the English critique of pure reason. Mm -hmm. uh, the German word Vernunft hangs together with Vernehmen, mm -hmm. which is poorly translated as to perceive or to see, uh, mm -hmm. whereas reason mm -hmm. means something like uh, ground, or again, goes together, I, I guess it's probably from the French, I would think that it sounds very French, raison, uh, that it goes together with more of a calculative um, approach to the world, mm -hmm. rather than one that is non-discursive, but one that is, again, standing in the amazement towards the world. And then tries to mediate the sense of the world. This is Vernunft uh, in, a, in a schematic explanation, but it's a, we're always uh, <clears throat> hanging in between very different understandings of, uh, of, what, we're, <laughs> of what we're talking about or trying to understand. Um, and, but to maybe come back to information as manipulation, there's a letter by Heidegger mm -hmm. from 1966 which is unfortunately is untranslatable because Geschichte is not translatable. It's not really history. It's probably more tidings or something like that. Mm -hmm. But he says here to his, to Klostermann, that is his um, publisher. Oh, publisher, right, yeah. Yes. So he writes to the publisher saying that, and actually he mentions one of your favorites, Karl Reinhardt. Mm -hmm. um, and he says that, Right now, what is upon mankind is the threat that everything geschichtlich, so everything that's not historical, but that is of the tidings being um, passed down through the ages, becomes a manipulable standing resource of information. <clears throat> and that's the threat. Yes. Because I found it, I think, <clears throat> very important to stress what you said, that there is in Heidegger another way of 
thinking through and articulating a way of being um, that is yonder of any dialectics and and also then tries to you know that could articulate an outside of the operations that are it yes. seems to be exclusive yeah and that's very and that that at first thought that seems like well that's not possible because as we said before any outside is incorporated as opposite and therefore positioned against it and therefore incorporated in gestell or positionality and yeah. it, i just thought right now that is how that is how one way to think or maybe this is just my you know kind of just stealing heidegger's gestell information is is just the most abstract the most generalized form of a resource a resource in general is information um, and can be interpreted as information um, and so that's kind of sort of a bad translation of gestell is seeing everything as standing reserve or resources to be utilized for some function functional purpose but i would say that information is 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 re is the quintessential resource <laughs> um yeah and uh and to try and connect it all with logic you know i love this translation of gestell's positionality that's uh johannes i believe that's your original translation right no 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 okay. uh, i've i've read it in andrew mitchell's fourfold so okay. this may have come out of their discussions at the collegium phenomenologicum etc okay um yeah but i but i love that because it connects with this very powerful word Zetzen, positing in German, which is extremely important for Fichte and all the German idealists, yes. but also um, a theme in logic that's very important. I think I think you said this recently uh, in a conversation that uh, you know George Boole, his logic is a formalization of opposites, you know, zero and one. And mm -hmm. what opposites are? You can see the word posit position is is in the word opposite. Yes, um, this sounds like a simple thing. But it's very important uh, how we conceive opposites. Aristotle thought there were many kinds of opposites. There were contradictories, there were contraries. And actually, uh, the, the man who succeeded Hegel's chair in Berlin, this is just a book on the history of logic in Germany in the 19th century, um, the man who succeeded Hegel, uh, Adolf von Trendelenburg, he wrote a book called uh, Logisch Untersuchungen, logical investigations. Mm -hmm. And there he criticizes Hegel for not understanding opposites properly. He's, he says that Hegel interprets opposites as only contradictories when we must be sensitive to this. And Trendelenburg was an Aristotle scholar as well. We must be sensitive to this other kind of opposite that Aristotle yeah. talks about called contraries. Um, and I, I'm not sure how valid that is a criticism of Hegel, but it's, it's very important how one conceives opposites um, for logic. And I would say even to understand, you know, the logic that underlies cybernetics, and then also to bring that into dialogue with positionality and this notion of gestell as positionality. So very fascinating. How do you view opposites then? Um, I mean, it has to do with negation, right? So we have to right away start talking about negation and the nothing. Um, and uh, Actually, what, what has uh, affected my thought uh, recently on this was, was your Nietzsche course, where we talk about uh, Nietzscheans, uh, not Nietzschean, but uh, Nietzsche's discussion of Apollo and Dionysus. Yeah. And can we just conceive these as opposites to be sublated into some mediating third, and we can just take the perfect balance or equilibrium of Apollo and Dionysus? No, it seems to be that the tension between them is essential. And so not seeing, not finding some mediating third between them, but also not just abandoning oneself entirely to Apollo, entirely to Dionysus. There's somehow yeah. a life-giving, I would say, way to conceive opposites where their difference <laughs> is not reduced, their self-standingness is respected, but their tension is not dissolved between them. And that's a very kind of phenomenological way. It's not very, you know, you can't formalize that necessarily, but it's very interesting. Yeah. By the way, I just read a, an amazing essay. Um, this is very speculative, but that actually talks about Martin Luther's conception of flesh and spirit as exactly trying to do that. Because for Martin Luther, according to this author, 
there was this reductiveness of he thought that some traditions had reduced sort of the relationship to one where we can actually free ourselves from the body and just become, you know, spirit in some way. And there are others that know we're totally condemned to the body. There's no way around. And Luther really wants to try and thread a needle where you, the human being is essentially the tension between flesh and spirit. And you cannot get away from that. You cannot resolve the opposites from one way or the other or sublate them. I think that'll be at the heart of the matter yeah. of, of this question. Also this, um, and there, I think there is genuinely in Heidegger something you mentioned before that he says logos is physis. We know what is one of the um, one of the fragments from it's fragment 123 in Heraclitus is physis scriptistae filei which is usually translated as nature likes to hide itself, which is already, of course, attacking it too much. It's bringing in nature. Mm -hmm. Maybe physis, physis is self rising out of itself, finding a stance within itself. That's maybe how to think physis translation, a proper translation philosophy must always think it cannot just operate with signifiers or else it just falls back into information again. Yes. The physics is self-rising out of itself. And cryptis die, and this is where the English language, of course, is um, uh, very limited is in that it has no reflexive verbs whatsoever. Yes. Unlike the German vernacular or even Italian and, and French, the, for example. The, the middle passive, in the, in the middle voice, rather, in Greek, you know. Yeah, it's, that's it's, the medial. That, yeah. that, that, that's, yeah. We don't have any of this. Yeah. Um, and the medial, so the medial means that it's not actually hiding itself as an object, you know, I'm hiding myself away. Right. Or not even reflecting back on itself in this deeper sense of, of, of self-reflection. No, it's, it's hiding or concealing or stealing itself away in something else, in the other. Mm -hmm. Heidegger makes this point, by the way, also in section, or sorry, paragraph 7a, and being in time on finest eye, the finest eye of phenomenology, the finest eye, something that lights up the phenomenon. Um, so, for example, you know, a sickness we never see, you, know, you don't see fever, uh, you see symptoms, or you can measure symptoms of it, but um, a disease itself never shows itself. Maybe that's mm -hmm. something to remember also in our time. Um, that maybe something, you know, some, some things cannot even be isolated. But the, so the, for Heidegger, of course, we also have um, the thought of the, the Lichtung für das sich verbergen, which is the most radical way of trying to say something that's not dialectical, the clearing for self concealment. Concealment is not around the Lichtung. There's not concealment and then there's a clearing within it. Um, so the concealment is not the limit of the clearing, but the clearing itself occurs for self-concealing, which is a re-articulation of physics scriptus file. Mm -hmm. And something else that I think will be important for, for anyone, and this is where Hegel can be extremely helpful, mm -hmm. is, is and cy cybernetics, information, etc. all works on the, and Gestell, of course, also, works on the level of Vorstellung. Mm -hmm. Yes, of representation. Uh, according to Bruno Liebrooks, um, formal logic, I'm reading from my notes, formal logic is verräumlichendes Vorstellen. That means it's spatializing imagination, mm -hmm. imagining. Uh, and the imagination has an extreme power over the human being. We can imagine very easily and quickly. But uh, an early example of a failing imagination would be Empedocles with his four elements. Mm -hmm. and the forces of love and strife. Why mm -hmm. does it fail to account for the one and the many for diversity in the world that still is not chaotic, but shows a belonging together? It fails because if water, air, fire, and earth are supposed to be elements, that means of a physis of their own, irreducible and onto themselves. But the appearances, then Empedocles says, are interminglings of those four elements, then the imagination breaks down because he begins with the concrete of the 
what can be represented and imagined, but then cannot explicate actually how one and the many uh, come about. How, so the articulation of, of so it seems to be somewhere here um, that there could be, speaking a slogan, that we could find an exit from this perhaps. Yes, on that, just on that note, I'm thinking of you know, Kant on the imagination, mediating sensibility and the understanding. Um, and, and yes, so, so, I mean, that, that's, I'm trying to, uh, I mean, it's difficult to, to talk about it, um, but yes, the, the concept of Alateya conceptual uh, thought by Heidegger or unconcealment does seem to me uh, a way to that sort of, it, it's not that it shatters dialectic, but it can't be, I'll use it as a verb, it can't be dialecticized because any yeah. unconcealment is to the extent it's unconcealment, also concealment. And so this is a new kind of relation between opposites where, you know, kind of the, in alchemy, they talk about the unity of opposites, but I think it's even different from that. Um, and yeah, part, part, of, uh, part of exploring that is what I hope to in some way uh, sort of build a bridge from the sort of cybernetic conception of, of our world of information, of opposites, of logic, to just these other suggestions, not as a uh, once and for all refutation or something like that, but just as, you know, there are other paths to be walked. Um, and it, actually Robert Brandom, who just published a big book on Hegel and analytic philosophy, he makes this point um, that uh, he kind of confirmed what I suspected that Claude Shannon's, just a, he was an engineer in, in a lab looking at communication and electrical systems, that's a foundation for the computer. His notion of information is basically, you have many possibilities and the fact that one possibility is actualized as opposed to others communicates something. So for example, you have a, a street a traffic light, you know, the fact that the green light is on and the other two are not on, that says something. If both the green light and the red light are on, that's, that's weird, right? It's not communicating properly to you. And there actually is something of a similarity, there. this is what Brandon says, to Hegel's concept of determinacy, of bestimmtheit, because Hegel, you know, drawing someone on Spinoza, omnis determinatio est negatio. Any determination, any actualization of something in some determinate way is also a negation of the other ways it could have been. And to make determinacy a problem, I think, you know, Hegel is going to, his discussion is much more philosophical, much more general than what, what gets discussed in cybernetics. But there is a deep, a deep kinship there. Um, all of that, however, can be, I think, rethought in terms of what is negation, what is nothing, what is even finitude, the finitude of determinacy, through perhaps, you know, a, a phenomenological uh, lens. And also, as you mentioned, Alethea, and this is, this is the most difficult uh, mo moment, this is, of course, to be able to articulate the Equiprimordiality, as Heidegger calls it, gleich Ursprünglichkeit, or the simultaneity, the Gleichzeitigkeit of these moments unfolding without um, <laughs> living in a world in which red and green lights up at the same time, right. because this is a, as simple as, as an example as it is, it's, it's very striking, um, because we need a technical, instrumental access to the world also yes without it we are we need to steer <laughs> if we are on a ship we need to steer the ship yeah um if uh i mean that so, yeah that's the difference between heidegger <laughs> and ted kaczynski you know is that just 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 rejecting the system again you are <laughs> you are reinforcing yeah. it you really have, if you really want to try and try and think some sort of outside yes you cannot be a luddite it just is it's even if you want to, it's not going to help you. <laughs> yeah, no, and you know, and 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 actually, um, this is not a genuine withdrawal. Uh, this example um, from anything, but so the, I think the the and this is a a gigantic task yes. is to try and be able. So, for example, for a Hegelian, 
Um, I mean, as you know, on the weirdest side of all of this technological uh, philosophy are people who say that the future causes the past. We are, it's always been meant to come this way. Uh, and if we are the, what are we, the, the bootleg system or something of, of AI anyways and nothing else, uh, we, we need to hook ourselves up <laughs> to the machine to survive as a species. I don't know if the human being is a species, which is just Verlegenheit. It's an embarrassment of the representation to categorize like this. Um, but on the, on the other hand, of course, for Heidegger also, that there's something that's announcing itself throughout the ages that we can see that there is a connection between um, Plato's eidos and the format, um, and also this kind of this uprooting through formalization, formatization. But also, in to come back to your example of the streetlight, for a Hegelian, I said before, what, what, if, you, if they look at an iPhone, that is at least my Hegelian friends, they would say, well, this is the culmination of all of human knowledge in one. Mm -hmm. um, not, not, not to, you know, uh, uh, deify the iPhone. It could be any, any tool of our current epoch because it, it represents our highest um, art of, of, uh, of computation, gathers it, and then lets us uh, control the world to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. For Heidegger, of course, this would be a bit different because there it's not the human being or human knowledge that's at work. But I think the mammoth, this, this you know, gigantic task will be to be able to articulate a way of being free with technology, its tools, with techniques in a broader sense and its realm in which we also stand and die mm -hmm. um so that it it there is root that because we need a technical uh a, a access to the world also right um if it doesn't help to be steering a ship or an airplane and saying well you know, life is really death and death is really life yeah. uh they're all intention <laughs> let's just right. let's just steer it right into the valley um, because, uh, because all is the same and nothing is all and all is nothing. Uh, so it, 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 we need to be able to find without, and this is also where Heidegger is very good because he never condemns technology, right? He, he never demonizes it. Um, and I wonder also what Hegel would have said if he had written everything a hundred years, just a hundred years later. I know. Just 100 years know. later. <laughs> It, that, you know, the, there were cars, airplanes, completely unthinkable. Uh, he was, he was uh, as H.S. Uh, Harris, who's uh, written some very fantastic, very difficult Hegel books. He says like Hegel was like he could still he was still living in a kind of Christian in a basically a Christian world. And. You know, I think about that, like, yeah, even a couple of decades more, he would have had to reckon with that sense of like, really, it's a, it's a different epoch. But yeah. that's, that's the, what the Weltgeist brought, <laughs> gave us, you know. Yeah, history, unfortunately, isn't what should have happened, right? Yeah. It's, it's what has happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and yeah, but the, the, to be able to articulate, you know, some people called it a, po a poetic uh, techniques um, Heidegger himself says that the aim should be to be able to establish a free relationship with techniques, technology, one in which we're not enslaved by technology. Uh, that's the monumental task. It's a worthy one, mm -hmm. um, precisely because an, uh, an ontology of what is, is lacking. It's simply taken as immediate and given that the world is, and we don't know yet what these operations will will lead to. Mm -hmm. um, but we can probably certainly say that um, what we seem to be <laughs> deeming true and and uh, and decided for will very likely not occur. Mm -hmm. It usually doesn't. I think if if we just stay 
unquestioningly and firmly on the ground. This is the information age. It's all going to be digitized. You know, even, just you don't even have to think in terms of concealments. We just think in terms of dialectics. It's going to come swinging back. Uh, but we need to be prepared for this also, right? To, to write this out, but then also to see what could be yonder of it. Yes, I, and it, yes, exactly. And, and actually that's, um, it's kind of a Hegelian uh, thing of, of kind of rejoinder to my project because in a way I'm kind of just representationally trying to move Heidegger's history of being, you know, like one step further. But, you know, yeah. Hegel's famous phrase, which I have here, which is, uh, if you read the entirety, it, it's quite beautiful. When philosophy paints her gray on gray, that's what philosophy does, by the way, um, then a shape of life has become aged. With gray on gray, one cannot rejuvenate, but only know. So a distinction between living and knowing. And the owl of Menorah flies forth only when dusk sets in. And I mean, that's everybody repeats that about Hegel. But what that really made me realize is that we can even name our current epoch, the information age, in a way is some sense it's over. And cybernetics is kind of yes. passe already. But that means that the future holds something hold something new um in that way that the kind of future it you know he's when you talk about time hegel and heidegger it gets very complicated quickly <laughs> the yeah, so, is to come <laughs> yeah yeah but from where right that that's, that's the question and if if it it can come from nowhere but then it also builds a world of nowhere mm -hmm. or if it we allow it to come from somewhere which is increasingly more difficult uh, or more excruciating and a, a task to rise to, then it builds another world. Uh, as you mentioned, the whole <laughs> of Minerva, but also the fact that we can name it the information age. I really uh, want to stress this again, what you just said, um, is that we can name, our, this, this is so strange also, right? That we, that modernity is Neuzeit, the Neuzeit, the new time that names itself Neuzeit as opposed to the old times um, and old ways of being, but also that it's, so this is something I learned from Dietmar Koch. So I want to mention his name to anyone who reads German. I would highly recommend his uh, essays and uh, he's in uh, Tübingen. Um, Dietmar Koch told me this is about four years ago. I think I visited him in Tübingen to uh, discuss uh, Gefiert and Gestell, fourfold and positionality. So the world of mortals and divinities, as opposed to Gestell, the world of machines and, and calculation. Uh, Dietmar said, Heidegger can name Gestell because it's already shifting. Positionality is already fracturing. Mm -hmm. It's already showing weakness. This is why it's it's uh, it's it's um, it's the it's like the apocalypse, right? It's it's most frightening when it's coming into its own and collapsing. Mm -hmm. um, so it, there are probably already shifts occurring. Um, it's it's also, of course, most powerful then because it's most visible. But it also it, it and even just you know this kind of what people talk just general talk about town you know, the tiredness with being online all the time, etc. Uh, so there is something already, I think, on the horizon or imminent. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not. Maybe there's no horizon. Maybe we just need pure imminence, which is <laughs> going to come out of it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I've I've never, you know, I, I speak with many people I regard as, you know, uh, intelligent as people who are thinking about the future, who are trying to get a feeling of where things are going, and. I mean, it, it might be especially pronounced due to the pandemic, but I've never heard so much uncertainty uh, with regard to people who normally have very strong views on what will happen in the future. I've just constantly heard of like, I really don't know what direction we're, we're going in. So it seems that the cybernetic age, far from being steered in any place, especially to terminate, seems to be in some ways a sense of rudderlessness and the, again, very Hegelian there, that <laughs> attempt to steer all things is leading to complete stagnance. <laughs> and yeah, and any, any dialectic that's, that's, that's opened up and, you know, 
they're very visible at this point because they usually come about as pro or anti. Yeah. But then there's no need to say anymore. It should be anyone who's still somewhat tuned into anything can see how these dialectics always are opened up at any given moment. Um, but the with the the with I think the art of withdrawal is not to move out and away from it, but to see within it what else is opening up also. Yes. Thanks to thanks to thanks to what is occurring. Mm -hmm. there, there's an unforeseenness. Um, and of course, you know, conspiracy theorists will go, oh, it's all planned. <laughs> it's almost ridiculous to, to, to believe that everything can be planned and steered. It, it over, this is quite funny to see how conspiracy theories are actually h highly cybernetic in that yes. regard, because it's perfect. Everything's perfectly steered and managed. And, yes. um, and there's never, never any, uh, uh, opportunity for, for so as I wonder why even you know why even consider conspiracy theories why even read them if it's all planned in advance anyways there's simply no point then if it's all planned in advance and it's all already agreed upon what's going to happen for the next 2500 years um, then don't even don't even read them yeah because th there is simply no point if there is never any kind of an opening or uh, withdrawal or escape in any way possible. Uh, I think that, that if we don't get sucked into the uh, <clears throat> dialectical motions that are so natural to us, and I don't think that they are erected artificially, I think that they simply, they come about now because this is how the cybernetic system works. It needs its own inherent critical opposition to find mm -hmm. where its weak spots are. Um, to see this and then be able to articulate ways out that don't then re 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 suck us in into some other kind of uh, treadmill. Mm -hmm. That that must be somehow the art. This is where Nietzsche comes in, right? This kind of artistic, um, poetic way of playing with opposites and allowing for the tension in life. And and by the way, <clears throat> just to have another label thrown at this that would be to exist tragically. Mm -hmm. Dialectics doesn't allow for tragedy, I think. Exactly, exactly, yeah. I had a great conversation uh, with, uh, with my friend uh, Christian about this. And uh, yeah, he, he pointed out how, you know, tragedy is a, is a very mysterious thing. Uh, especially, you know, the, the Greek tragedy, because um, the inevitability sort of of the, the wrong thing coming about or evil coming about is a very strange message if you really take it to heart. The idea that there is unavoidable, you know, tragedy that can, cannot be outstripped, to use a Heideggerian term, um, like you, you, it's very hard to put that into dialectics or to a story of progress or to a formalized system that in the end, oh no, it was really for the, for the best. There is something, you know, I don't want to say irrational. It's not just the opposite of rational, but there's something, you know, a rational about that. Yeah. Yes. It, it's completely outside of this. It's the day non, right? It's the, the yes. Greeks called it day non. It, it's the unfathomable, overcoming moment of tragedy where nothing can be reversed it's taking its course it must be done um and uh, this is anti-modern of course yes that there are necessary tragedies like that is a that is a denotaton you know that is a terrifying thing <laughs> yes quite terrifying should we leave it at the terrifying Yes. Are we terrified Terror enough? Terror is always a good note to end on. <laughs> Very good. So we leave you terrified and horrified, and we'll speak more as the project progresses. That's Just right. To have towards, this. Its, towards its end. <laughs> towards its, okay. Very good. It's it's completion. Yes. It's Thank you. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks very much.